えー、それでは、えー、皆様、えー、時間になります
My name is Aizawa uh, from uh, Kyushu University. I would like to uh, express my gratitude to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. I would like to talk about uh, building uh, and uh, integrating uh, the Indonesian state. Uh, I would like to talk about building and consolidating a United State of Indonesia politics of unity in diversity. As was touched upon by Professor Hayase, uh, one of the features of uh, Southeast Asia is uh, fluidity. And also this morning, uh, Professor Tanaka uh, gave us an overview of uh, the diversity in Asia. So uh, when you consider all these uh, uh, elements, as we look back, particularly in the 1980s thereafter, why do we have uh, achieved uh, peace and uh, stability in the region? I think uh, this uh, merits of, uh, of research. And with things as they are, uh, it shouldn't be stable in international relations and also in uh, regional order. Or in terms of management of uh, single countries, there are elements that lead to uh, instability. We can identify many of them still as uh, touched upon by Professor uh, Tanaka, uh, the, uh, they are where they are. So to understand the history of a single state, we have to look back on uh, the both internal and external dynamic uh, equilibrium. Uh, we have to re-look at them uh, to see the internal pressure, external pressure, how they have overcome these. Uh, the subtitle of my uh, presentation is uh, Politics uh, of Unity and Diversity. And so I think uh, the history of Indonesia is a history of overcoming this uh, kind of uh, challenges of uh, uh, splitting the disintegration, particularly uh, where well, the diversity of society is uh, uh, irreversible. And uh, so in this uh, diversity, how should we achieve uh, inst uh, stability? So the unity in diversity uh, is the uh, uh, national uh, well uh, tenet uh, uh, according to the constitution of the country. And also that's a motto of the uh, European Union. And also that's uh, also a motto for the uh, uh, post apartheid Southeast Asia. But uh, 45 years prior to that, the uh, Indonesia uh, has been uh, pursuing this uh, uh, motto. The, uh, because of this uh, uh, the society and uh, according well uh, I have attached a map in the handout uh, in terms of uh, religion and also ethnicity uh, it's uh, quite uh, convoluted uh, in the case of Indonesia particularly uh, those of you who have been there uh, they are not uh, dialects but this is a country of uh, Multi languages. How do they uh, do communications? So, looking back on the history, uh, it's a miracle after miracle uh, in this country. And I would like to talk just a part of uh, the history of in, uh, such a country, Indonesia. So, the question is: uh, Has how has Indonesia built, consolidated, maintained a multi-ethnic, multi-religious nation state? I have been thinking around these issues. Why do we have this question? Because, as uh, quoted in the handout, Professor, uh, President Habibi in 1988, uh, Suharto regime uh, disintegrated. Immediately after that, uh, he became uh, president of the country, and uh, we have uh, the words of him. And I'm not going to read everything, but. Uh, uh, not because of culture or ethnic uh, uh, religion, but uh, uh, we have uh, uh, been uh, colonized by the Dutch uh, for 350 uh, years. Uh, that's why we're able to uh, integrate the country. Uh, well, uh, well, it's how, how can they maintain uh, independence? Uh, so, uh, well, the country is uh, lies on this. Uh, foundation and in 1998 he uh, recognized this, the president of the Indonesia and uh, I think uh, there is, this is because of wisdom of many people uh, this is such a fragile foundation so the uh, uh, separatist movement has uh, uh, occurred many many times uh, from uh, the uh, uh, colony to the state nation. Every time they had a crisis, there, there was a movement to, for independence and they overcome all these crises. 
industry. I, I can't really look into all these uh, because I need uh, hundred, well, hours to discuss this. So the last miracle, it was the uh, 1998 uh, Asian financial crisis, the uh, economic crisis. I would like to just focus on post-Asian uh, crisis period. So as mentioned by Professor and President Habibi, what is Indonesia? And uh, the uh, this is a former uh, well uh, territory of uh, uh, the uh, Dutch, and uh, so it was uh, uh, the uh, colonial state uh, to begin at the beginning. So the state was. Uh, uh, Unified, but uh, the ethnicity was uh, divided. But the state was unified, and so when you say state, the you had a unified mechanism, and uh, the uh, people, goods, uh, information, and for standardization, there was a, a technique for the uh, governance that was introduced to this region, which was a major factor. So the uh, nation was divided with the uh, Dutch at the top. The, uh, there were uh, foreign Asians and then uh, indigenous people. So there was these uh, three uh, divisions and there was a, a limitation to the uh, travel of people. So this was uh, a divided uh, society in Indonesia. And one of the uh, last features of this period is uh, there was a reaction. So there was a unified language, uh, language for unification, which came about. In, in talking about Indonesia, uh, President Habibi is, uh, talked about the uh, former uh, Dutch, but uh, the reaction to that is uh, Indonesian language. And this, I think, was uh, a very important wisdom, because uh, the unified uh, language, the language for unification, So comprehensive uh, uh, communication language was necessary for Dutch East in the East Indies. The Javanese, not the uh, uh, largest population Javanese, but the minorities language was used. The majorities language, majority rule, if that's adopted uh, in the politics, well, uh, the uh, minority language, the uh, uh, the merchant language, Indonesian, was used for unity. And this was, uh, well, a uh, movement, uh, Indonesia as a movement. This Indonesia was just uh, uh, colonized, but uh, Indonesia became a subject. And that is uh, a major point here. And uh, when uh, Indonesia was uh, occupied by Japan, in terms of uh, unity, so you had a div division and uh, there was a reorganization. The, the uh, governance uh, structure was passed on uh, from the Dutch to the Japanese. But the major point was the reorganization of the society. I said that during the uh, uh, Dutch uh, colony period, uh, the society was divided into three. In the case of J Japanese, uh, uh, well, the, uh, the last uh, part, uh, the the nationalism came about as a reaction, and uh, with that as a lever, the society was reorganized. And this uh, was one of the characteristics of the period when Indonesia was uh, uh, governed by Japan. So I would like to uh, rush here. And after that, uh, from here, how uh, Indonesia overcame the uh, crisis of uh, uh, division. Now, in 1945, uh, as a nation state, after the defeat of Japan, Indonesia uh, declared independence, but uh, uh, a unified uh, nation state did not come about immediately after that. In 1945, after 1945, for some time, uh, it was uh, multiple countries. Indo Republic of Indonesia was there, but uh, at this point in time, Java and Sumatra, uh, the about uh, uh, one half of the current uh, uh, territory uh, was the, uh, within the Republic of Indonesia. So in addition to, well, the uh, uh, puppet regime of uh, the Dutch, there were many such states uh, in 1945. So uh, we didn't have uh, the unified Indonesia as we see it today. Not just that, but uh, ethnically, uh, well, there were uh, states uh, 
Well, and also there was a, a Soviet regime and also Islam regime. So uh, this was more diverse than the current uh, Middle East. Uh, all so, so, sorts of uh, states were independent and uh, were con coexisting. There was not a coexistence because they were fighting with each other. This was an age of uh, quite a confusion. And uh, now uh, the uh, military uh, was uh, the name of the game. The uh, And uh, Skarno and also the uh, vice president Hatta, uh, these, uh, uh, this pair, uh, did the military and uh, uh, the diplomatic uh, capabilities and created a new state. So in this uh, age, uh, uh, in the Skarno age, the, in uh, creating a nation state, the, it, they didn't uh, uh, succeed, the, the Dutch colony, but uh, as it was a, the, with the military and uh, uh, arms, uh, they uh, overcame this uh, uh, confusing period. And of course, uh, this has to do with external equilibrium, but uh, within the country, the equilibrium uh, or dynamism, there were forces that were uh, in opposition to that, uh, namely the Dutch and the uh, Americans, specifically. They were anti-independence movement and anti-Skarno uh, campaigns and also uh, smarter independence uh, campaigns. In many ways, uh, external uh, intervention took place. And basically, uh, the military power, like uh, guerrilla uh, uh, well, uh, warfare, through these uh, military activities, the crises were overcome. Uh, in addition, the military internal uh, independence was achieved, and after that, uh, they were dependent upon uh, the uh, uh, diplomacy. And uh, there were a lot of uh, turmoil in connection with uh, turmoil, the uh, diplomacy, as was mentioned by President Habibi. Indonesia is uh, co should cover uh, the entire uh, territory under the Dutch uh, colony, but uh, the current uh, West Papua uh, at that time, uh, this was not uh, considered to be recognized by the International Community as part of Indonesia. So uh, through diplomatic uh, negotiations, they had to achieve uh, independence. But at that time, uh, during the uh, Cold War period, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Dutch, vis-a-vis -vis the uh, United Nations, they had to do uh, diplomatic negotiations. When it fails, for example, the, uh, uh, f for the establishment of uh, Malaysia uh, over the uh, uh, well, attribution of uh, Kalimantan, uh, they uh, well, uh, withdrew from uh, the United Nations. For the sake of independence, they did everything, internally and externally. That was uh, the central part of uh, politics of Indonesia at that time. And that was about to come to an end or uh, didn't, uh, there was a major change of uh, government from Skarno to, well, nine, after 930 incidents, there was the uh, change of government. And uh, the new government uh, arose, but still for independence of the country, there are many homework left. And first, the uh, internal independence was achieved through violence. Up until then, the internal independence uh, or unity was uh, uh, done through unity, but uh, from there, the uh, centralized way, uh, the uh, force was used for unity, and uh, communist uh, uh, people were uh, massacred, and also the uh, uh, Islamists were removed, and Skarno uh, supporters were removed. So internal war still continued, and externally as well, uh, uh, the uh, homework from Ascano age. Papua, at that time it was called the Irianjaya, and also Aceh related issues. Through uh, military campaigns, uh, these were resolved to uh, uh, achieve uh, independence, and that was a very important internal and external policy related matter. At the same time, in this age, 
to uh, unify this diverse society, one uh, approach that was used, the uh, state building through economic growth. Uh, in 1970s to 1990s, the economic uh, development uh, was used for ethnic, uh, religious, class-related uh, identity politics uh, was uh, suppressed by the center uh, that continued until the 1998. Uh, and uh, from here, uh, this is my focus for today. So, uh, well, uh, force was used very much. So the uh, society's uh, confidence in the nation uh, plummeted uh, to uh, suppress the, the uh, anti-government forces. And so people had a resentment to the government. And this, uh, so like uh, uh, what happened in uh, Yugoslavia, balkanization uh, was a concern in Indonesia as well. The diversity in society and also the uh, top-down uh, approach of uh, unity, uh, deep, well, based on these uh, uh, the uh, history, the Vulcan medicine was an imminent threat. Uh, well, I didn't uh, read uh, all the uh, parts of uh, President Habibi's remarks. It was just uh, on the other side of the door. So uh, the uh, uh, international community was looking at Indonesia with a concern, but through democratization. <coughs> democratization, uh, Indonesians overcome this. The more democracy uh, taking root, the uh, uh, less control there would be on uh, the diversity. If you try to achieve democracy in diversity, uh, it is more likely uh, to end up in uh, uh, separate uh, separatism. Uh, it didn't happen. Why? Well, uh, uh, there is a, uh, this has to do with the election system or the uh, administrative reform. For example, the presidential election, first uh, uh, it's, they started with parliamentary system and uh, so people get used to elections uh, through parliament and then they uh, transition to uh, direct the election of president and uh, there was a lib well a opening for the uh, participation of uh, political parties in elections. But uh, one uh, important point was uh, not to accept uh, uh, regional parties. If uh, parties uh, represent the uh, interests of uh, regions, then things would go in the direction of uh, separation. Such a, a centrifugal force may uh, work. So from uh, Jah Jakarta, the such a uh, well, uh, the democracy uh, should uh, bind the uh, nation. So the, one of the rules is among the 36 uh, provinces, the, uh, uh, there should, well, the parties have to have more than 30 uh, branches, uh, branches in 30 uh, provinces. If there is a force that uh, say that uh, the uh, election is, uh, uh, well, uh, farce, uh, then uh, this kind of a uh, uh, party would not be accepted. On the other hand, there are many, many uh, int uh, well uh, inclusive systems, but on the other hand, the uh, viewpoint of uh, diversity was emphasized. So this was the, considered to be the bottom line for elections. Another wisdom is the uh, combination of president and vice president. And what does that mean? The cross-identity political uh, forces need to be in place uh, so that uh, for you to win in the election. If you just uh, have only Javas, then the uh, uh, the oppositions would be Sumatorans and Kalimantans. That would be uh, not welcome. As the vice president, vice president, not just president, but uh, this holds true for all the uh, elections of governors and so on. There has to be a pair in all political systems Identity, uh, cross identity, uh, well, a uh, force uh, can win in the election. That's the kind of game that uh, uh, should always be in uh, elections. That was the uh, wisdom. And also another wisdom is the separation, uh, accepting the separation of uh, East Timor. If you just look at it on the surface, uh, this may be just uh, uh, only change in the uh, territory in Asia. But uh, b based on the calculation of Habibi, the East uh, Timor uh, used to be a colony of Portugal. So not, it wasn't a uh, uh, Dutch territory. So because of this rule, the East Remo Timor uh, separation would not uh, run counter to the uh, national tenet. So the calculation was, in return for that, the former 
Dutch uh, colony, well, uh, including Aceh, uh, Papua, all these uh, country, the uh, territories will not be accepted for independence. So there shouldn't be any domino effect. So look at it uh, uh, on the surface. The uh, East Timor's independence uh, looked like the uh, uh, beginning of uh, uh, disintegration, but this was, uh, uh, well, against uh, uh, the uh, dominant effect. And uh, uh, there are many other things, but another important point is the decentralization. Indonesia uh, democratized the uh, diverse society, and uh, that was uh, uh, made possible because of decentralization. Decentralization, what does that mean? There are three things. The budget, uh, decentralization, and also the uh, governors uh, or local uh, representatives, they are directly elected. And also uh, the, uh, the increase in the number of uh, uh, the uh, local governments. So if you increase the number of local governments, what happens? The, uh, uh, because there are many ethnicities, uh, you have lots of heads, no matter who the head is. Um, the e Indonesia's unified election system, uh, as far as they adhere to that, these, uh, can, these people can uh, have authority for the localities. So that means that uh, rather than uh, vying with the uh, state, they should uh, participate in the uh, system of the uh, national government. And that's the kind of game that uh, permeated the, every corner of the society. And the number of uh, states or number of uh, prefectures, if you look at that, uh, there has been a far larger number these days. If you are Indonesia, if you are a government official, uh, there is um, more and more government officials that have been elected by people. So uh, by incorporating the uh, local uh, governments within the state system, they, uh, were able to, they have been able to achieve uh, a unity of the uh, country, Indonesia. Why have they been able to do it? Uh, maybe uh, partly because of uh, the uh, accident. Maybe uh, if uh, he was uh, not a Javanese, well, the, uh, the Habibi was, was a Bugis, and uh, the head of the uh, ruling uh, party was uh, Atak, not uh, Javanese. This may be an accident. What is more important now we, as we look back on it, uh, the uh, people who were supporting the decentralization and uh, they became uh, the political elite. For example, President uh, uh, Jokovi was the, uh, uh, used to be uh, a mayor of uh, Asolo and he became a uh, uh, governor of uh, uh, Jakarta and became president of the state. And so, uh, well, so, um, in uh, the localities, uh, the participation in the state politics, so socially and politically, they were able to uh, move on the, to uh, the uh, uh, political ladder. And that has been functioning uh, in Indonesia. And that's uh, one of the uh, important factors that allowed Indonesia to overcome these crises. And lastly, just one word, at the end of the handout, Last week, uh, there was a unified uh, a local election. Last week, it was interesting. In Indonesia, uh, even if uh, there is one candidate, they do election. If there is one candidate, uh, the opposing person is uh, the, this white box. This white box, well, it's Kassel, uh, in a city of uh, one, two million population, uh, this uh, white box won. So it's larger than Kyoto. The, it's a mayoral election, and this white box won. So this way, uh, the participation in elections has taken hold uh, culturally. So the uh, ex well, the uh, political campaigns uh, external to the uh, election uh, can be checked by this kind of a system, and that so uh, that can secure uh, people uh, to participate in the uh, elect, uh, national politics. And so that's my presentation. Thank you. This morning, Professor Kashima talked about the critical juncture as a key word in talking about the, the nation building in China and in Indonesia. In 1945, 65, 98, I would say those will be the critical junctures. 
Now, Professor Nemoto is going to be talking about Myanmar. And again, there will be critical junctures. And maybe it's a fact that the Yamaka publication news series, they have a year on uh, the cover. And so in that sense, in history, critical juncture is now a focus of attention. And the critical juncture of Indonesia and also the critical junctures of uh, Myanmar are similar or different. But if we take that perspective, maybe if a similar year appears, it could be common to Southeast Asia, or if it's different, then maybe it would be unique to Myanmar. So we can think in that way, and therefore, I think we should also focus on critical juncture in listening to Professor Nemoto. I am so uh, Kay Nemoto from Sofia University, and in this uh, big project of Jaya, I am in charge of uh, the individual history, that is uh, Burma, Myanmar, and in history, based on the academic uh, study. I am to uh, indicate uh, the uh, history of uh, the nation. And there have been three failures and the fourth attempt. That's my title. And you see before you my resume. And this is, you could say, just the structure of the paper I am writing right now. So it's not necessarily completely coinciding with what I will say. And in historical studies, uh, you ask questions from the past, then you start from there. And always, you ask the question from present to the past, then you get the answer from the past. And right now, what kind of situation is Myanmar in? What kind of problems do they have? Well, one thing, you probably are interested in the Rohingya issue, and it is uh, about 700,000 refugees which are outflowing, and uh, Aung San Suu Kyi is uh, trying to resolve the problem, but it is not going that well realistically. And there are two uh, obstacles to the solution. One is the military, the Myanmar military, and the constitutional uh, right that they have right now. Myanmar has military control and civilian control, and there is a division of roles, and Aung San Suu Kyi is the national advisor and uh, higher than the president, but uh, she can only uh, instruct the civ on the civilian control side, and therefore the military, if they are severe against the refugees, uh, it is very difficult for Do Aung San Suu Kyi to do something. The other obstacle is public opinion. That is, uh, against the Rohingya, they are rather cold. And it has to do with national identity or the indigenous uh, tribes. Only those are the uh, Myanmarese. And based on that, uh, the Bengal uh, Rohingya, which came in later on, uh, they feel that uh, they should leave. So in terms of uh, the uh, ethnic identity, you have to be indigenous, otherwise you are not uh, uh, n the national population. And there is the 1982 uh, nationality law. And uh, how did this uh, problem appear in the past? Well, to repeat, the military involved in the politics, and then you have the indigenous tribes. Unless you're the indigenous tribe, then you cannot play the central roles as a peoples of uh, Myanmar, and uh, later coming people coming in later have to be put on the periphery. So uh, how did that come about in the history of this nation is what I would like to think about and also ask questions about. Well, put another way, you have the relationship between politics and the military and also the ethnicities, and that would be the two key words. And also, I said indigenous uh, tribes, and if you are indigenous, is, are you automatically core uh, people? You also have to be Buddhist, 
and so you have to be indigenous and as well as a Buddhist and then for the first time you could be considered the core population of Myanmar and if you are not the Buddhist but you are indigenous you are still people and uh, uh, those who are not indigenous well sometimes they are given nationality and sometimes not because uh, they are from the outside, uh, they are aliens, and that is the uh, um, general view in Myanmar. So you have this kind of characteristic, and how did this appear? Well, how did this way of thinking uh, come about? In terms of critical junctures, so there were three failures, and the fourth challenge, that's my subtitle, and uh, very simply, three failures and the present challenge, it will be introduced. So. It, it, it became independent from the UK, and you have uh, uh, the search for the parliamentary uh, uh, democracy. That's the first uh, uh, try. And then it does fails after 14 years because the parliamentary uh, democracy was not uh, stable, and there, a new actor arises. And this new actor is the Burmese Armed Forces, the colonial army and uh, made by there is the national army made by Japan, and then they came together and they started the, the Burmese Armed Forces after the war. And after independence, uh, there is this internal uh, turmoil uh, by the indigenous peoples, and then uh, there is a change, and then uh, they re have a bigger voice, and then you have the Kuomintang forces uh, coming in, and so that uh, more than before, the military is uh, becomes more engaged, and uh, ultimately, uh, the, 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 there is the rise of military, and that's the, the, the second uh, uh, time where you have the failure. You have uh, parliamentary democracy failing, and then you have the military, and they try to go to socialism, but this socialism is not trending to Marxism, it's not Soviet type, it's not Chinese time, it's a unique socialism for Burma. Burmese way to socialism is tried to manage the nation. However, this Burmese way to socialism, and I'm not going to talk about the ideology here, but uh, uh, how is to be the framework of the country? Well, you have a centralist and uh, unitary control and at this time, uh, the military creates such a, such a system, and uh, the uh, province is given to minorities, but the uh, provinces are controlled. It is uh, centralized, and it is uni unitary for 26 years, and that is the second uh, attempt, uh, the characteristics. So the military is uh, uh, promoting this, but the, what kind of political view did they have to begin with? Uh, in uh, 1965, uh, they have uh, there is a the only party that allowed, which uh, has a party seminar, and the leaders uh, have talked about uh, political views. Uh, Sign you, that is uh, the military that is uh, involved in politics is the only good uh, uh, military. It, sh it shouldn't just be professional military looking just at uh, the defense. In other words, uh, the Burmese army have to promote the revolution and have to be responsible for politics. And he, is clear he clearly states that, and that view is forgotten in this uh, first attempt period and at that time, the military was only doing the defense. But uh, there is this uh, noble mission that is recalled, and then in 1962, a coup occurs, and then uh, they become involved in nation building. And so you have this uh, professional um, military that is negated, and uh, they have to have responsibility towards politics and to be engaged in politics. That's a matter of course. And uh, they criticize the Indian military because uh, India just is uh, specialized in national defense. 
And so even if politics uh, goes afraid, they don't take any responsibility. The Pakistani uh, troops are good because uh, if there is confusion in politics, then they become a junta and uh, they try to save the nation. So uh, although uh, it is the same uh, colony of UK, you have this kind of uh, view toward uh, uh, involvement in military. And after independence disappears and in Burma, they actually uh, take control of the administration, uh, the government. So this uh, attempt, in this attempt at national building, it's uh, uh, very uh, um, centralized. And uh, the military in 1982, during the socialist period, uh, has a revision of uh, the uh, nationality law, and they indicate that it should be centered on the um, ethnic uh, indigenous tribes, that is, uh, those people who are living there uh, f f from 18, before 1823. Why 1823? That's when you have the first invasion by the UK, um, the first uh, uh, UK uh, Burmese war, and then uh, from the outside, uh, there were n no outside people. So they come up with this fiction. And then when you have this war starting with the UK, then uh, Indians come in or the Chinese come in, other peoples come in, they say. So uh, this uh, first war, the year before that is 1823. So you have to be living there uh, from before 1823. And if you're a descendant of them, then you are considered to be indigenous and automatically given nationality. And there are 135 such ethnic groups right now, and these, if you're outside that, then you have to have screening. And uh, then after the screening, you, if you find out or you can prove that you've been living there for three generations, four generations, you are given nationality. If you cannot prove that, you become a quasi or um, a lesser uh, people. And uh, others are considered to be foreign, and the Rohingya are considered to be foreign. Now, uh, so you have this uh, socialist uh, uh, moves and a unitary uh, rule. And uh, uh, there is the um, independence movement. And that's in 1988. And then uh, there is this uh, military rule for 23 years. And during this period of time, various uh, things occur. And uh, they take more than 10 years, and they come up with a constitution that uh, the military like. And as a result, we have you have the 2008 uh, constitution where you have the military, which uh, monitors the uh, parliament. And as I said at the outset, the military control and civilian control are divided. And uh, that is, uh, uh, you could say, found in the Constitution. And military control is by military, of course, but also uh, police. And the other is the border control. That is, uh, you have uh, those three. And it is under the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Home Affairs, and also the Ministry of Border Control. And this is uh, under the control of the military. And the minister is the uh, supreme commander of the military. And the Rohingya issue is uh, involved with all three areas. It is military, it is police, and also it has to do with the border. And so uh, in these three fields, uh, civilian control side can state their views, but they cannot uh, give instructions or be involved. And so Aung San Suu Kyi is the top person in the civilian control side, and she herself can has a sense of mission to lead uh, Myanmar, but there are the constitutional restraints, and she can only state her opinions. That's the reality, and the characteristic of that is the 2008 Constitution, as seen in the 2008 Constitution. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, the military uh, rule uh, uh, then uh, becomes democratized, and then uh, it is uh, after the constitution is made, uh, where there is military oversight of a parliamentary democracy, and then you have Tain Sein administration, and they make changes, and then up until the uh, uh, present day, you can call that the fourth attempt at nation building. 
and uh, the Tainstein administration in those five years, there are many positive changes. And then you have the president Aung San Suu Kyi administration, which uh, follows up on that. Uh, you have military control and civilian control, a division of roles. And they, uh, she wants to change the constitution, but she cannot because of the strong resistance. And also the hurdle of changing the constitution is quite high. And so that being the case, civilian just using just the powers of civilian control. Somehow she is trying to promote nation building and on such an occasion there occurred this uh, Rohingya refugee um, mass outflow. And uh, the Rohingya issue, uh, well, symbolic of that is that uh, the indigenous peoples are the central uh, people of uh, Myanmar and also uh, the military being involved in the uh, politics as part of the constitution. So, uh, where do you, uh, uh, where is the roots of this? Well, there have been uh, three failures, and then the fourth attempt is ongoing. And uh, the, the, if you look at the actual roots of this, during the British rule period, you have to go back there. And according to the paper I'm writing right now, it would be chapter one that uh, uh, the uh, governance system, uh, there, I said that this was a fundamental uh, change and um, uh, all of the colonies' experiences, but especially uh, Burma became a province of the uh, British. And so all the traditional states were crushed and a new uh, system was introduced. So. It was not protectorate, and uh, there were there are two uh, key characteristics or issues that I'd like to point out. One is uh, the implementation of a census, a population survey, and all the colonial states do this. And through the census, the uh, the ethnic uh, people, uh, um, and you have the rulers, and you have the indigenous people and uh, the ethnic uh, people are given identity through ethnicity and it's not just counting the number of people uh, there's also the ca categorization by religion but uh, through this uh, uh, ethnicity uh, you are able to get your first identity or the primary identity and then you gather that and then you have the union of uh, Myanmar or that is after the Burma after the independence and uh, you are a certain uh, ethnic uh, people and then indigenous people and not only that you are well after the war of aggression by your case uh, you were there from before that time so you have that uh, ranking also involved and basically the colonial authority you are the Burmese province in the British India and they tried to take that policy of uh, putting a, a, a ranking on people. Uh, you need Indians as uh, workers, so many Indian people come in and uh, the uh, colonial authority will welcome that, but uh, they are put in un unhygienic uh, environment and uh, you have various cities and the uh, problems of uh, uh, control so that uh, the UK um, colonial authority uh, thought in this way that the Indian people uh, are put in a they like to be in a very dense uh, area and they uh, bring in infectious diseases that's not the case in Burma and they are tending not to get the infectious disease well Indian are unhygienic but Burmese are relatively sanitary so they take that theory uh, that is the UK takes that theory and they bring that into their colony Burma and then uh, after nationalism is seen in uh, Burma you have this kind of uh, uh, discourse on uh, people which is utilized to exclude uh, the Indians and uh, put the priority on the Burmese. So that strengthened the discourse of excluding the Indians. And then as a result, you get this uh, centricity of indigenous people and the people coming in later 
well, uh, the uh, state will decide whether to give nationality or not. And uh, um, also, uh, the other area, another characteristic is the military. That is naturally, uh, the colonial uh, military is uh, established, and uh, you have the Burmese uh, people. They could not really uh, join, only through exceptions. And after independence, the uh, Karens and uh, other uh, minorities who are giving the um, nationality could join, but uh, the Burmese. 65% of them could not join, and as a result, what happened? Well, you have, uh, within the independence movement, the colonial forces were not considered uh, their uh, force, and uh, instead, uh, uh, the, they said that they, they, they were foreign, so they have to have their own military, and then you have uh, uh, Japan uh, come, trying to approach them, and then uh, Burmese uh, troops uh, come in, and then um, the independent forces uh, uh, appear. And so uh, the Burmese people could not join uh, the uh, colonial forces. And so, conversely speaking, uh, under the support of Japan, when the uh, military was uh, uh, made, uh, then they were not only there for independence, but uh, they were s s Burmese. Uh, or indig indigenous uh, Burmese people, uh, and uh, they are to make the new Burma, and then naturally, then it's not just national defense, but they are going to be the military that gets involved in politics. And so uh, that is what I would like to discuss in my paper, and that is uh, what I'm emphasizing today. And so right now, um, if we try to summarize the problems in Myanmar right now. I want to say the following at the end. The biggest uh, challenge, you have Burmese nationalism, the strong exclusivity. To what extent uh, can the people uh, agree and uh, can th that, uh, to what extent can that be controlled? And uh, this exclusivity uh, uh, that is trying to exclude people who are not indigenous, and you want whether that can be changed uh, uh, consciously, uh, that will be the major challenge. And it is also a very difficult uh, issue that uh, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi has to make efforts to resolve, but uh, it is still a, a long road ahead. That reality is seen right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> from three commentators, five minutes each. First, Professor Kurihara, for five minutes. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Kurihara uh, from uh, to the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. Uh, I am the expert on Vietnam, and uh, when thinking about Vietnam, uh, I think the two speakers uh, gave me a lot of useful information. Uh, very briefly, I'd like to give a report. Professor Aizawa's report, first of all. Unification. The uh, basis for uh, unification is very weak, and I think it's the same here. Uh, that is, you have the division uh, north south of Vietnam, and often that's a point of focus. But actually, I often say it's been divided since the 17th century. In other words, there was uh, in the north uh, the uh, dynasty and also Gwen uh, uh, di a dynasty by the Gwen, and uh, there has been uh, a division since those uh, days. And well, in Vietnam, though, you could be divided, but uh, they can get by. There is uh, the port, and there is uh, some linkage, and they were able to get by. And it's true, during the French rule, there was divided into three, Tonkin, Annam, Changshin, 
and the framework to overcome that was Vietnam. To recover uh, the Vietnam, and that becomes the uh, target, but that's true, but uh, the Viet in the case of Vietnam's Communist Party too, this with this overcoming north-south division to become one, saying that uh, one Vietnam, that's that's all. And it, I all think that maybe it's okay to be divided, but uh, this kind of very loose state system, why couldn't they have that? Professor Aizawa, in terms of the days of the union, well, uh, they tried to uh, federate, and I would want to ask him a question. Why this uh, f f federation union didn't work, and why did they have to force the unification? Because this is common with Vietnam, I wanted to ask that question to him. This uh, federation, federalism, that is. And uh, in, from 1975 to 1976, there is uh, unification by force. But in terms of uh, the spiritual unification, I think even now, people in the South still have some uh, very uh, complicated feelings. So that's my question to Professor Aizawa and to Professor Nemoto. I'm very interested. And this is to do with not just Vietnam, but Southeast Asia as a whole, that the military gets involved with politics. And especially you talked about the second uh, time, second attempt. You uh, negate the being just uh, occupationally the military and uh, just national defense uh, role is negated, you have to also be involved in politics. So I think this is important in understanding the present situation in Vietnam. And I also uh, think uh, about uh, this. You have the military and uh, the non-military civilians, civilian control. But in the case of Vietnam, you have the Vietnamese Communist Party, and under French rule, there was the militant, militant uh, resistance to that. Uh, that was the start, and 1930s, uh, to divide uh, soldiers and civilians. It was a very difficult situation, and both, you could say, were kind of intermixed. I think that's the uh, characteristic. For example, Bozen Up, uh, uh, General Bozen Up, and he passed away at 103 in 2013. And Bo Up was not a career uh, soldier. He was a teacher, and it just so happened that uh, he was told to arm and uh, uh, became part of the defense ministry and uh, Ko San Lee is from, oh, sorry, Bo San Rik he is a professional uh, military person and uh, still there are military people in the Politburo and in the Central Committee and as parliamentarians, sorry, in the Politburo. And so it is top down oriented uh, leadership style. And I think that has to do with the past history of the Vietnamese uh, Communist Party. You cannot separate it from its history. Now, I want to ask, it seems to me that the role of the military is coming down in Vietnam, 
and there are the so-called four roles in the party and the leaders. And in the past, the military person was uh, always included, but not the past 10 years. Rather, it is the uh, public security people, uh, the police that are participating. And uh, uh, so, in the case of Burma, I'm not clear, the police, for example, if the people cause a demonstration in Vietnam, the police or the security forces are in charge, but in the case of Burma, what is the relationship between the military and the police in Vietnam? The role of police, I think, will become greater. So that's why I'm asking the question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, Professor Tamura. In this project, I'm in charge of Singapore, uh, individual countries' history. I have, uh, I think you know, a uh, Singapore. In Singapore, per capita uh, GDP is higher than that of uh, Japan. In Malaysia, Mahathir, a former uh, prime minister, achieved a comeback and the uh, opposition party coalition bo uh, won but in singapore it doesn't hap it hasn't happened why can she mean a system is still in singapore and hasn't changed and then i would like to ask questions about the problems that uh, uh, singapore is facing up until now can she mean a uh, system has been maintained because it's a fragile city country. In 1965, August, from Malaysia, uh, it actually uh, ceded and uh, became independent. And Singapore is not endowed with the hum uh, natural resources. Uh, its resources is only people. And for to g develop a uh, ruling party believes that uh, you cannot uh, actually you you control opposition parties and there's a, a sedition law and the security maintenance law still alive and in 1959 to 1990 uh, actually 2460 people were actually uh, arrested and there was 1.5 million population at the time of uh, independence in 1990. It's 3 million. So 2,460 is a large number of people who are actually arrest arrested. And uh, you said Chinese, C, Malaysia, Malay, M, and uh, India, I, and uh, others, O, classify uh, race by races. But the common language is English, and CMIO, actually, P, uh, uh, population was uh, classified into CMIO f to be ruled. So you cannot uh, criticize uh, other uh, ethnicities' uh, language if uh, there's a movement to promote the Chinese as national language that was suppressed and controlled. And uh, there are many uh, Chinese, and uh, so some uh, neighboring countries uh, look at the Singapore as the third Chinese country, and maybe that is one reason why English was elected, elect, selected as an official language. In international area, what sort of external equilibrium it has achieved? In June, in Sentosa Island, uh, there was this uh, U.S.-North uh, uh, Korea summit meeting. I think you are all aware of it. Ever since it became independent, it has a lot of economic interfaces and relationship. And former Lee Kuan Yew said it, uh, Singapore will trade with devil if it's necessary. So, uh, uh, not have to, uh, it doesn't, 
in terms of uh, trade, it does uh, with any th country. And uh, you don't uh, depend on specific uh, countries, but the multilateralism was used. It has good relationship with uh, China, but it has special relationship with Taiwan. And the Singapore National Army uh, does exercise, military exercise in Taiwan almost every year. It's well known. So because of China and uh, Taiwan, uh, b b with both they have good relationship, so they placed the uh, venue for two straight uh, uh, convers this conversation. And also it gave, gave a venue for the summit for U.S. and North Korea. So I think it will be maintained as summit city of international relations. So that's how it has uh, achieved external equilibrium. And also uh, uh, only one party uh, has been in power. But the younger uh, people are now are trying to start a movement to change it. And it has maintained uh, in good international equilibrium, but uh, it is now becoming difficult to maintain relationship with Taiwan because of the rise of China. And from now on, Singapore will face a decision and will face a critical juncture uh, in terms of relationship with China. Well, this was a very rough overview of the state building in Singapore, but I have questions. There are a lot of Chinese in Singapore, so the relationship with Singapore and China, and also other Southeast Asian countries' uh, relationship with China. There's ASEAN 10, six countries, uh, uh, for six countries of ASEAN, China is the biggest trade uh, uh, partner. And uh, how Burma and Indonesia will maintain uh, this sort of relationship with China? That's the question. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, next, uh, lastly, I would like to invite uh, Professor Takawi, please. Thank you. Uh, this is a very valuable opportunity for uh, me. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Takagi with GRIPS. Uh, we have had uh, a very uh, dense uh, discussion over long years. I'm sure you're all tired and uh, my uh, brain is also a chaos. So let me be brief in making some com comments. Now first, uh, my first impression uh, about listening to the presentation, and based on that, I would like to share with you the uh, two cases of Indonesia and Burma. Well, uh, I have a lack of knowledge, so I'd like to ask some questions. Now, my comment first, as I listen to the presentations, uh, including the uh, morning session, the as we consider critical junctures, and uh, if you try to look at it uh, uh, from uh, uh, sideways, now, uh, the importance of uh, international relations is something that I was struck with. Now, uh, I have a conversation with South Asian Indians, and they, they are Filipino. We just look at the one uh, country. And, uh, well, uh, researchers of just one country look at other countries because of uh, uh, they have to uh, do uh, something uh, because of, uh, well, teaching something. So that's point one. So, and uh, now, why uh, are these uh, critical junctures, critical junctures? Politically speaking, at that time, the, uh, uh, at the critical junctures, you can uh, opt for uh, options uh, that uh, uh, can't uh, be looked at uh, in other occasions. So they are critical because uh, that has a long-term implication. So considering critical junctures, means the how many options can be taken why did the country uh, take such uh, an option so selection or a force to be is to select well this well the in the english title of this is a state building and uh, i think uh, this uh, has a lot to do with it the state building and also state formation they are two different things uh, state formation in international relations uh, you are forced to uh, do selection, and uh, the, uh, th that uh, dynamics re is related to uh, state formation. And uh, if you, uh, well, if you pay attention to the individual power, then that's uh, a state building. Uh, 
the nation building. This word is used in uh, political science. That is the orthodox of uh, use of the words. So, uh, looking at critical jun junctures is to look at uh, the uh, people who did uh, uh, state building or people who made a selection. So, what are the available options? Uh, as we imagine, uh, from the uh, uh, third party perspective, you make comparison, and uh, there are other countries that uh, chose something different, and so there were multiple options. And uh, then, why did these uh, uh, people uh, make a certain selection? I think this is an important point that we have to consider. So, I myself. Well, I, uh, I'm going to write a chapter on the Philippines, and with that in mind, I'd like to write my chapter. So today, uh, we listen to a, uh, a presentations about Indonesia and Bur Burma. I have some questions. Now, if you look at the uh, critical junctures, uh, well, the uh, research on critical junctures, well, if you look at it uh, from, uh, uh, well, uh, sometime later, uh, it's natural, but uh, it's very difficult uh, if you look at it uh, as you uh, look at it from the uh, contemporary. Well, colonization, independence, Cold War, democratization, these are major events that have happened, and at each different time period, uh, different uh, choices were made. And that's very clear. Now, in the age of uh, colonial states, as I listened Today, I have a, a renewed question about Indonesia. Now, in uh, nation building uh, in Indonesia, I think uh, systems were focused today. Having said that, the, uh, in research of uh, uh, well, colonial states in, in Southeast Asia, Indonesia's uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, state is a, a fundamental framework, and that is my understanding also. But uh, in such a country, the anti-colonial uh, uh, campaigns were carried out by, say, Scarno, uh, activist Scarno. Uh, why did he uh, shoulder the uh, independence movement? In comparison, in the Philippines, the colonial uh, parliamentarians, the uh, members of the parliament did it. In Burma, uh, the uh, formation of uh, military took place. The way it was done, well, according to Professor Nemoto, I learned a lot. And the uh, way he, the uh, colonial uh, uh, state, uh, uh, well, uh, that uh, defined the military. Now, there were uh, colonial bureaucrats and there was a military in the case of Indonesia. Uh, why? Uh, well, someone who was good at uh, uh, speech, uh, who uh, did uh, good uh, politics. Why did he, he, he well, uh, achieve uh, hegemony in campaign? Uh, this is an important point, I think, in comparison. In terms of the period of independence, in comparison to Philippines, Indonesia, the Philippines, Burma, both, uh, they were neutral and uh, uh, they tried to uh, build a state. In the case of the Philippines, uh, on uh, July 4th, uh, independence was achieved, so that was uh, greatly affected by the American model. In the case of uh, Indonesia and Burma, uh, this was quite different in terms of choices. And so I have... Uh, well, to specialists of Burmese history, this may be a rudimentary question. I'm sorry about this, but why, in the case of Burma, uh, Burmese uh, uh, socialism, this kind of uh, mysterious uh, selection was made? Well, those people who chose it uh, thought it was important. I understand that. But uh, on the Western countries like the UK, US, uh, Burma are going in that direction. How did they look at it? Uh, that's my question. So, you know, up until the 1960s. And the uh, next uh, democratization period. Democratization. Again, uh, I think this is a critical juncture looking at the modern day uh, Southeast Asia. When you consider Indonesia and Philippines, I think uh, the traditional, uh, well, the uh, economic crisis leading to, uh, well, uh, the uh, democratization, I think uh, this applies. In the case of the Philippines in the 1980s, economic crisis basically was uh, a debt-ridden uh, administration and the interest rate increased in the 1980s. Uh, things went wrong and that led to a political crisis. In Indonesia uh, in 1980s did not experience uh, economic crisis. Why didn't it experience uh, economic crisis in the 1980s in Indonesia? As for Burma, the, well, economic crisis leading to democratization, this did, wouldn't apply to Burma. 
again, this is a, a would meta question. At what that timing, why did uh, uh, democratization uh, to take uh, uh, life? Lastly, post uh, democratization political uh, development. One question again it has to do with Burma. At the beginning, uh, Rohingya issue, I am paying a lot of attention to it. I'm doing a lot of research, but uh, the, uh, uh, this is a result of a dividing rule of a colony. But what uh, I don't understand is why this timing? Uh, because culture, ethnicity uh, may be explainable, but in most cases, uh, uh, timing can't be explained. So uh, this uh, uh, well minority issue has been here for a long time, but uh, it's now a big political issue. Why now? And about Indonesia, again, well, uh, this is something that I asked in the uh, research session, but uh, the, the system formation after the democratization, irrespective of uh, economic performance, does it function? That is uh, one question that I have. Uh, if you just uh, take a snack shop now, the Islamism uh, is now having a larger voice. Uh, that may be one way to look at it. Again, uh, this uh, if you look at the culture, why uh, do we have this uh, in front of us now? It's unexplainable because of uh, economic difficulty. So the uh, system that was uh, formed in the democratization, what is the expiry period? Uh, what are the economic uh, background that uh, led to this. If there's any such thing, what is it? So I have asked so many questions, but uh, these are my questions. Thank you. Thank you to these three speakers. And uh, we're going to run out of time, so we'd like to ask the two speakers two or three minutes each, please. Professor Aiza first. Yes, thank you for the questions. And first, uh, uh, from Professor Kurihara, your question, why not? Why the federation system not uh, work? Well, one year it was tried, and to be succinct, the federation system in Indonesia, it's called the F word in uh, <laughs> Indonesia, F federalism is the F word in Indonesia, and the reason is that uh, there was a substantial rule of the Netherlands, and it, it seems to signify that. And in, in Indonesia, uh, the resources are positioned uh, in a rather uh, lopsided way, and uh, you didn't let it go. After the war, you have oil fields and puppet administrations were made in such areas. It could become independent, and the uh, UN could allow that. There is uh, that kind of political uh, mechanism, but uh, if you take a federalism and fix it, that then the uh, independence as a state uh, would not be allowed, and that cannot be allowed. So somehow you had to uh, dis uh, deal with the guerrilla activities. I think that would be the explanation that's easy to understand. And of course, there are uh, some uh, emotional feelings left, and uh, in many places uh, it's still quite Java centric, but uh, there is the magic of the republic, in other words, the magic of the word that is still in terms. Of of the uh, election rights, it's the same. Uh, voting rights, it's the same. And also in Suharto period, uh, actually, if you are uh, Javanese, you were more the challengers, and the minorities had uh, uh, been placed priority and also been put in very high level positions. So, in that sense, uh, some of the emotional uh, issues were resolved in a different way. And this was not a question to me, and that is uh, from the military to the security forces, that same in Indonesia. During the Suharto period, the military lost the power and uh, dual function, that is uh, doing both the military job and also the political job. That 
if it collapses along with Suharto, that would not be good for the military. And therefore, in order to protect them, their self-organizational, they left the Suharto, they left this dual function, and they had to turn themselves into solely military uh, uh, presence. And it went well. And President Yudo Yono, a former military general, and after the democratization, uh, he was able to uh, retain the top position. So uh, the profit of the military and uh, profit or the interest of the um, re regime uh, was uh, separated. That was some momentum in Indonesia. And uh, in the relationship with China from Professor Tamra, well, in, in Indonesia, as you know, it is uh, having the biggest uh, uh, overseas Chinese communities. You have uh, China, the overseas Chinese community government. If you want to look at the relationship between them, if you study Indonesia, you can get all the answers. In the case of Indonesia, it is very difficult. That is, depending on the state of China, things change quite a bit. That is, uh, you have, if the Chinese economy, if it's not trusted, uh, then uh, the foreign uh, Chinese community will uh, become more active. But uh, in now, Chinese inside China, they don't have to depend on the overseas capital. That uh, just with domestic capital, they can get by. That means that the overseas co Chinese community, well, that will become rather cooler. Uh, so in the case of Indonesia, is it the uh, government or is it the financial circles uh, which is going to be having the relationship that is uh, the factor now it's now uh, the political circles and uh, uh, you don't have to uh, go through the Chinese community you can go through whatever uh, minister but uh, in the past uh, you got links with the overseas Chinese community first and then the financial circles too. And so depending on the trend in China, uh, the balance in politics, uh, the, uh, the financial circles, and also uh, um, that uh, relationship is uh, different and maybe different in Singapore. But uh, between politics and uh, the business circles, um, the seesaw game of the overseas Chinese uh, can be seen. So depending on the timing, well, now you, uh, um, the political side is more conspicuous or now the business side is more uh, conspicuous and there's coordination. So if you do a factor analysis, then you can see these actors. And also on the, the business side, financial side, there's two factors. There is the national run and also the private side. And if you have the infrastructure-based relationship, then it would be the state-run uh, uh, parties that you deal with. And uh, now I think uh, the phase is uh, shifting uh, to the uh, private side, and then the actors would change. And... So then uh, there will be a coordination between the private, the uh, bureaucrats, and the SOEs. So uh, you would have a kind of an adjustment out there. Now I'd like to go on to Professor Nemoto because of time. Yes, uh, then I'd like to respond to Professor Takagi at another time. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, about uh, Professor Kurihara's uh, question, if I may answer that first. Uh, that is the police in Burma. Well, as I said, you have the military who are controlling, and uh, let's say there's some demonstration that occurs, then to suppress that, it would be the security police that they have lighter arms, and not as much as the military, and you have a kind of, uh, uh, on their arms, uh, some kind of uh, insignia which indicates uh, that uh, they do the security maintenance. and. Uh, in the past, they shot actual bullets, but now they start with rubber bullets. And recently, you don't see them too much, but uh, when expelling the Rohingya, this uh, uh, security police, in the negative sense, was quite active. And also, as for the professional soldiers or the career soldiers in Burma, you 
There are two occupations that are not really accepted, one to the military. If you ask them if they're professional soldiers, they would slap you. And then to teachers, are you, if you ask them, are you professional teachers, then that's not like because teaching is not for money. It is uh, to educate uh, uh, people. Uh, it is like a, a holy uh, uh, occupation, and therefore they feel that they should not be called professional teachers. Now, uh, Professor Tamura's question about the relationship with China. Uh, during the military rule up until um, 2011, uh, maybe there was uh, too much emphasis on China, but actually, was not uh, uh, stationing, and if you look at the long history in Burma from the dynasty age, the relationship with China, well, the, the confrontations are more no numerous, but the border is connected, and therefore the economic exchange is uh, a very important, so in that sense they are an important party. And during this military rule, you tended to China because uh, they were the large power, uh, the, one of the few powers that supported the military rule, but still the Myanmar uh, junta, well, vis a vis China, the base of the military would not be allowed, and also the Chinese military passage was not allowed. And China side, uh, they wanted to check India, and so they wanted to go through Myanmar to go to India, but uh, the military uh, in um, Burma, uh, Myanmar did not allow that. And now you, there is better balance uh, between uh, exchange with uh, EU and Japan and China and the U.S. Now, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi is uh, taking a realistic stance in the relationship with China. On the other hand, she also talks about ideals that is in the relationship with China, it's not just uh, about profit, it is about uh, uh, or just uh, receiving assistance, but rather the peoples uh, should respect each other and you have to have that kind of relationship is what she is thinking. And as for the question by Professor Takagi, if I may answer very simply, why is the um, Burmese socialism chosen at that time? Well, uh, in the 1930s, uh, there's the Burmese nationalism and independence movement. In other words, to make uh, Burma independent as uh, a socialist country, that was a common understanding. And therefore, in terms of parliamentary uh, democracy, they become independent. But uh, gradually, the economic system would uh, turn socialism, that was a common understanding, but that did not go well, and therefore the military uh, forced uh, uh, this. And it's the time of the Cold War, however, and therefore uh, then it, um, it's possible that the Soviets and China could intervene, and therefore they wanted their own unique uh, form of socialism. That was what they declared. Now, uh, democratization from an economic uh, a crisis. Why didn't it happen? In 1980s, there was a demo, uh, uh, actually movement for democratization, but uh, Burmese economy was really in a dire situation, and they didn't know what to do. And people were angry about the economic situation, and uh, they criticized uh, uh, the military and the government. And uh, then there was a, a transition to civil uh, government uh, voluntarily by the military. But the military actually um, maintained some sort of influence over the government for its own survival. So the economy and, uh, and uh, police, politics are interconnected. And the Rohingya issue is politicized, that's what people say. But in 1970s and 1990s, there were a lot of uh, refugees leaving uh, Myanmar. This happened since 1970s. So Rohingya issue uh, has been uh, actually focused uh, since 1960s inside Myanmar. There is a large outflow of refugees because democratization actually proceeded and there's a freedom of uh, speech but which resulted in hate speech so you can actually uh, make a hate speech freely and uh, that moves the military and the government to some ex to some extent thank you very much indeed sorry we don't have any time to ask a question to ask or to entertain questions from the floor, but just for one minute. Southeast Asia, we have uh, discussed as a matter of fact, but Southeast Asia, uh, which in the 21st century, uh, 
Timor Est is included, but the ASEAN 10 in, in the late 1970s, uh, it became Southeast Asia. Uh, if we look at Asahi Nenkan from 1952 to 1974, India, Pakistan, Ceylon were actually part of Southeast Asia. And 75, 76, uh, South uh, Asian uh, column was made in this, uh, but the Burma was included in the South uh, Asia. So from 1977, ASEAN 10 uh, was regarded as the Southeast Asian countries. And after that, in reality, they could not uh, implement uh, many actions. But uh, 1990, ever since uh, it became ASEAN 10, there's a stronger unity. But it should not be looked at as the same way as EU. Uh, in 2015, Asian community uh, was declared, but the organizationally and the institutionally, it's quite different from EU. And the positioning of Southeast Asian countries, they actually uh, prioritize national interest. And when it satisfied and supports national interest, they use ASEAN. So they use it as a leverage. So nation building is important for each country. That's what I wanted to say at the end. Thank you very much. I would like to close this session. <coughs> All of the speakers, thank you very much. With this, we would like to close uh, this open uh, uh, symposium looking back at Asia in the 20th century. And from JIIA, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. I, Director General, Acting Director General, will say a few words of closing remarks. I would like to thank all the professors, all the speakers. Uh, it lasted for five uh, hours, and we had very uh, intensive uh, reports and discussion. It was very meaningful symposium. Uh, if I had listened to uh, the lectures when I was while I was in the university, I would have learned a lot. That's what I felt listening to the uh, presentations. We talk about history and parallel history. Uh, this project lasts for three years. This is the last uh, year, so we are in the last stretch. I would say uh, for all of you who uh, participated in this symposium feel that uh, this uh, project is really rich and uh, in depth and, and has a depth. So parallel history's benefits were actually uh, uh, obtained. So I hope we can expect a very uh, prominent and uh, results and outcome from this project. I'm looking forward to it. And very high level discussion was actually uh, carried out. And uh, we would like to uh, send our messages to overseas in an accurate manner. We have and JIIA, uh, Japan's uh, uh, external relations and uh, history has been the focus of our uh, projects because, of course, it is important to learn about the external relationship with other countries, but at the same time, diplomacy is uh, closely related to uh, national identity. Uh, it's the projection of the national identity. And, of course, uh, history is, uh, is, uh, is uh, identity is based on history. So, we have to focus on history, and uh, this sort of a good uh, discussion was possible because uh, very academic and uh, academic uh, research was carried out, and we have sufficient uh, human resources to. And this is uh, uh, today's uh, symposium is a demonstration of that. And as a diplomat, uh, as a institute uh, working on inter national relationship, but we would like to discharge our role in an earnest way. And we talked about critical junctures many times, and uh, this might be a critical juncture for Japan. 
having that thought in our mind that we would like to work on our activities. I would like to thank uh, Professor Tanaka, who led this project, and all other professors. Uh, my gratitude is not only for today's symposium, but for your work for this project and for uh, writing papers. I would like to thank uh, the participants in the audience for listening to the presentations for a long period of time. So now we would like to close this symposium. Thank you very much indeed.